you are listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast series, brought to you by our gold sponsors, MRP, Laser Uptech, and Equa Marketing. We also want to thank our silver sponsors, IELTS Works and Pronox. If you would like to network and share your experience with our podcast guests and other aesthetic industry professionals, join our Facebook or LinkedIn communities by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Today, we're going to be speaking with one of the finest experts in aesthetics. Our host, Jeffrey Richmond, is an award-winning 20-year veteran of the aesthetic industry whose passion led him to co-found the Business of Aesthetics community. Over to you, Jeff. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Business of Aesthetics podcast. We're uh, thrilled tonight to have Dr. Jeffrey Lysecki with us. Dr. Uh, Lysecki comes to us from from New York, from uh, um, right downtown in in New York. We were uh, just joking about the, the huge pond of New York and aesthetics. But Dr. Lysecki, thanks for joining us tonight. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And right, right uptown in New York City. <laughs> uptown and uh, <laughs> on uh, and your Park Avenue, you got the the Park Ave address. Yep, yep. 70, 71st and Park. Awesome. Great. I uh, I'm really interested to you know talk with you, especially about uh, you've done so much training, and just more recently have decided to move into your own private practice and start 100% cosmetic uh, practice on your own. And I, I'm excited to talk with you about the building of that and the transition and how much work that's been. And, and then I'm guessing your training led you there, you know, from the standpoint of you got your hands in lots of different things and decided what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we all, you know, every plastic surgeon starts off, you know, training in in everything in reconstruction and cosmetic, um, in face, body, breast, nose, you know, uh, the the whole the whole gamut of plastic surgery. Um, so everyone does that, and you know, the cosmetic stuff um, was was definitely what you know I kind of gravitated to as as residency went on, and then I went and did a, a specialized fellowship in aesthetic surgery. Um, and that's really, um, you know, where I definitely honed, uh, my skills, especially with facelifts and rhinoplasty and facial cosmetic surgeries and also breast surgery, um, you know, on top of everything. Um, and, um, but, but also learned a lot of the skill set. you know, got to work with, you know, experienced, you know, master aesthetic surgeons, um, and also people who, you know, have their own practices, um, and got to, have that exposure, talk to them about how to run a practice, see how they ran their practices, uh, you know, take the the things that I want, you know, for my practice from, you know, from each of them. Um, and that, you know, talking to them and learning from them is really what gave me the confidence to just start a practice. Yeah. And I always think, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to go into a house that's built and make it what you want. Sometimes it's easier to build your own house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was, that was the decision that kind of ultimately it came down to. Um, it was a little bit geographic, you know, I knew that I wanted to come to New York City. Um, and then of the things that I found in New York City, um, it was, you know, there were things that I knew that I was going to join for a year or two, to get some cases, get a little bit of, you know, uh, advertising on, on their backs. Um, you know, build a little bit of a reputation, but then ultimately leave and do my own thing. And so, you know, when it was do something else for two years and then start from scratch or just start from scratch, I kind of just decided to start from scratch. It's, uh, it's, um, I want to talk to you about how you've been recruiting patients, because mm -hmm. when I think of New York, I mean, here you show up on Park Avenue in New York and you're like, I'm here which is awesome. But then I think of, you know, like Times Square, not a certain amount, you know, what, 30 blocks from you or something. It's like um, the noise is so great that mm -hmm. does anyone even notice that you moved into the building? Yeah. Like, let alone the neighborhood or the block or the city. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And not, not immediately, which is, which is good because I think, you know, what, what I wanted was, 
you know, a kind of, I wanted my office to be kind of an escape from the city. Um, and so it's a very, you know, private kind of boutique office. It's the same couple of people working here every time. There's not some revolving door of people going through, you know, it's, and you, you come in and it's quiet and it's just relaxing. Um, and so, so I do kind of like being a little, little bit under the radar. I think my patients like, you know, a little bit of respite from the city and some privacy. Um, but, but yeah, just, you know, getting, getting the word out and having people know that you're here is, is difficult. I mean, there's, you know, I think 150 or 200 plastic surgeons on the staff at my hospital. Um, you know, the stretch of Park Avenue that I'm on between the fifties and the, you know, eighties, um, has some of the best plastic surgeons in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, it, it's definitely a big pond to jump into. Um, and so finding, you know, I think finding my niche, um, and finding how to connect with patients has definitely been, um, the challenge and, and still something that I'm, that I'm working on, but kind of the fun, exciting thing to figure out also. How, how, so how are you reaching Patience. I mean, you can't open the window and scream out the window. Yeah. And you had said that uh, you're not, I mean, you really committed to cosmetic because you're not taking insurance. You're not doing the reconstructive at the hospital, which mm -hmm. is a route a lot of plastics take. So how do, how do you directly reach patients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's a combination of things. There's no one thing that does it. Um, uh, social media has been really fantastic. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, very intentionally growing my Instagram and TikTok, um, and, you know, trying to really promote quality content on there, you know, not silly, flashy stuff, not, you know, gross, bloody stuff. No, you know, you won't find me dancing, um, on any platform anywhere. <laughs> um, but trying to put good educational content, honest before and after photos, um, and just trying to put out things that, you know, answer people's questions and make people feel at ease about the process of, of cosmetic surgery. You know, so many people are interested, but just don't know what it entails or have questions that they might be afraid to answer or to, to ask. Um, and so uh, social media has been really powerful, A, to reach people and have people find me, um, but B, uh, to connect with people. Um, and people, you know, I have patients who come in because of uh, a video they saw me post on Instagram and, you know, because I seem like someone they would like, or I answered a question that they had or didn't know that they had. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, the question is, you know, why, you know, why would someone come to me when there's, you know, 300 other plastic surgeons within a stone's throw of me? Um, and I think it's because they like the information you put out there. They like your perspective. They connect with you in some way. And social media is just kind of the best way for that to, you know, to happen. Um, and then there's other venues also. Um, Real Self is a website where you can answer patients' questions and patients post reviews um, of you. And um, that's kind of a nice, you know, a little bit more, you know, if you're on Real Self, you're thinking pretty seriously about plastic surgery. So, um, you know, I've certainly gotten some patients off of there, answered people's questions, and then they come in looking for surgery because they like the way I explain things. Um, and they see reviews from other patients who, you know, had good experiences um, and so things like that have been really helpful also, but it's everything, you know, I also, you know, do website and, you know, SEO and all that kind of stuff, but that's just, that's slower. I mean, there've been people who have had a website for 20 years, right? Um, of course their website shows up on Google before mine does right now, but it'll come with time. Yeah. And they've had their blogging and they have more reviews and all that stuff that, that mm -hmm. helps. Um, yeah. I think you're right. A lot of that is time, but the social media aspect, I, I love because I think that there's a large segment that say, let's say that has good SEO that mm -hmm. has a good referral base, or, you know, they're already a couple months out for their surgery schedule. So they're not really recruiting hard and they don't have an Instagram account. They've never been on Instagram. Maybe they've been on Facebook. They've mm -hmm. heard of TikTok, but they're not even accessing that market of what now could be 30 and 40 year olds. It's not even that you have to be 18 or 22 to be on TikTok. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. Most of my, 
I um, I recently had a video go viral on TikTok, which is the first the first really I thought that I had ones go viral before until this one. <laughs> um, but I posted just a kind of silly video about me explaining a, a procedure, um, and it went nuts. And I, I I'm amazed um, at the age range of people who are seeing that video on TikTok. I thought that it would be a bunch of twenty year olds. Um, and there are 20 year olds, but there's also 30 and 40 and 50 year olds on TikTok who are going there, who are looking for plastic surgery content, who are inter interacting and asking questions and, you know, even calling in and making consults off of, uh, off of TikTok, which is, which is pretty wild. Um, and then Instagram, yeah, I mean, Instagram is not, I mean, I don't know what you define as young people anymore, but, uh, Instagram is a lot of people in their thirties and forties, um, also, I mean, which are, which is my demographic. So it's my patient demographic also. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, the age range is, you know, twenties through, you know, mid twenties through mid forties is definitely the, the bulk of it, which is great because that's right around, you know, that's the age of most of my patients. What a great way to, when you think about the roots of marketing and, and, and getting patients to know you, getting them to like you and getting them to trust you, uh, so much of that they're able to do over a social media platform, they don't need to meet you directly as much anymore. And or even just leading up to the consultation, mm -hmm. they feel like they're introduced, you know, somehow they've been introduced to you. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, great, great icebreaker, um, because they see you, they even sometimes see you interacting with a patient um, and see, you know, what your bedside manner is like. And then also, I mean, almost all of my content is filmed you know, here in my clinic. So they see the exam room that they're going to be examined in. Um, and I think it's a great, you know, just, just introductory thing. And it, it helps people feel much more comfortable um, coming in and, you know, having a consultation because it's a very personal thing. I mean, it's not, it's not for nothing that you come in and tell someone, you know, Hey, I, you know, wish my nose was smaller and breathe better, or, Hey, I'm really tired of my sagging jawline. And, you know, it's, it's personal. Um, and so I think it helps to, to make it personal, acknowledge that it's personal and connect with people on that personal level. Do you have a, like a social media schedule or do you commit to, how do you do it? How many times a week do you post? No, um, on, for Instagram posts is in story or, I mean, is in, um, you know, uh, uh, posts or reels. Um, I do it on the order of two or three times a week. Um, I think that's, that's been good for, you know, steady engagement. I think it keeps the quality high also. I mean, I do see people who post much more frequently, um, and maybe, you know, that I'm sure, you know, that works for, for them. Um, for me, I would rather have two or three really meaningful posts a week that people get a lot out of, um, and, uh, then, then do, you know, two posts a day and have 80% of them be kind of filler, um, and I think you kind of, you know, kind of see that. I mean, I think I get pretty consistent views on my Instagram, um, for, you know, for that reason, because I do try to make everything pretty high quality. Um, and so I don't have, you know, some video that gets a hundred views and some video that gets 5,000 views, you know, they're all pretty, pretty level. Do you, do you like look at your schedule in the morning and think, oh, this would be a great thing to share later today or. I'm going to um, ask, I love Betty and she's so nice. I'm going to see if she'll let me do a video with her or. Yeah, it's a mix of things. You know, if I have someone coming in, you know, if I, if I know there's something that I wanted to talk about um, and I have someone coming in, um, you know, I just, uh, I just put up a video about, you know, taking off the splint after a rhinoplasty. Um, and, you know, I, I knew that was something that I wanted to have a video of. I knew that I did a, a rhinoplasty on a great patient who was really nice and who was okay with, you know, her footage being put up. Um, and so I did kind of slot that in for that day. Um, and then otherwise, I just I have a list of ideas um, and, you know, I try to film, you know, a couple at a time um, and, and put them up on, some, you know, some sort of regular schedule. Um, so it's a mix of ideas, you know, from my list that I know I want to talk about and then also things that arise organically during the day. You know, the video that went viral on TikTok was me talking about face type because I happened to be doing a face type case. Um, and I had the machine right there in my hands. And after the case was done, um, you know, I said, Hey, can you guys film me talking about this for 45 seconds? Yeah. I mean, I would think, uh, also if there's, um, you know, uh, the, the influencers happen to be doing something like on face tight, 
Mm -hmm. And then you post a video on FaceTime explaining it. Then it really, because people are out there Mm -hmm. searching. So I, that's something I always suggest to everyone as well as look at, you know, uh, Harper's Bazaar and Cosmo and some of the Mm -hmm. big ones just to see what the, the trends are, but that's, that's, I mean, they, yeah. Um, I saw you have uh, face tight. Is that who makes that? Uh, it's made by a company called InMode Aesthetics. InMode, okay, yeah. Because I saw also you had Morpheus. Yes. Yeah. That's another InMode. In, Morpheus is the need RF micro needle one. Yeah, yeah. So face tight and body tight, which is the body version, are um, bi- bipolar radio frequency. So there's a little probe that slides underneath your skin through a, a small incision. Um, and then Morpheus is radio frequency micro needling. So it pokes a bunch of needles in um, and then the energy gets gets passed through the needles. Oh, neat. So it's, but the, the body tight and skin tight piece is almost, it sounds almost more like uh, uh, when I think of like um, laser assisted liposuction or something where you can, I mean, because you're actually uh, ablating tissue or you're heating it I guess anyway and you're doing it subdermally yeah yeah exactly it's I think a similar idea um with a very different endpoint I think laser liposuction um is probably getting a little bit out of style I'm, I'm sure there are some people who are still using it uh the radio frequency the point is really that you heat to the extent that you uh make the body you know stimulate new collagen growth um and it and it leads to skin tightening um, I think that's kind of, you know, the, the invoke thing right now. Right. The wound response rather than desiccation. Exactly. Yeah. The goal is not desiccation or coagulation, although it, I, it probably does a little bit of both of those. Um, the goal is, is really the stimulation of the, of the collagen um, and leading to skin tightening. Is that two different devices or all on the same device? Um, it's all on the same device. Yeah, you can get uh, you can two, get two modalities, but in the same box. Exactly, you can get the same box and have both both modalities in it. Are you using other technology as well in the office? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so our, right now we've got the Morpheus, uh, we've got the in mode stuff in the operating room, not in the office. Um, in the office, um, we have uh, a Cyton laser, um, and so for resurfacing, uh, Halo, which is kind of a you know. Um, it's a it's a great in office laser. It's kind of a milder resurfacing than the the big guns, um, and then BBL or broadband light, which is you know kind of a high end um, intense pulse light photofacial. Yeah. Um, so we use that. Um, we also we we have a skin pen. Honestly, we love the skin pen. We use it so heavily. Um, it's you know it's great. People like micro needling will often add micro needling to Botox and fillers and stuff, um, and do kind of in office things with that. Do, are you doing uh, exosomes and PRP and some of the newer stuff? Um, yeah, PRP. We're we're looking into. We actually we we just uh, we just got a hold of a centrifuge for it. Um, we've got to um, start doing it. Um, exosomes we have not gotten into yet. I'm very intrigued. I I, I got an, a chance to experience exosomes a little bit during my fellowship um, from uh, from my mentor there, who is started starting to look into them. Um, you know, PRP, PRP is interesting. The data is not real clear um, on it. Uh, if you ask people who do a lot of microneedling, they think PRP speeds the healing a little bit. Um, but probably, you know, is the endpoint really that much better? It's kind of unclear. Um, and the studies say the exact same thing. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's, I think it's nice. Um, I think it's an interesting thing to add. Um, but, you know, it's also just fine without it. And there's great skincare also, you know, microneedling is also an opportunity to use uh, some of the good skincare, some of the peptides and growth factors that are, that are out there. Um, And so that's really what I've been focusing on right now is, is, you know, microneedling and Botox and fillers and then good skincare. When these um, patients are coming to you, I know when we pre- uh, you know, pre-talked a little bit, you had mentioned a patient that came to you for a rhinoplasty that saw some questions that you had answered on Instagram and, be, you mm-hmm. know, got familiar with you and came. I'm wondering, are you seeing a lot of surgical cases from that? Or are you seeing some non-invasive stuff and then those patients are going to grow with you? Like what's the mix of patient coming? 
Mm -hmm. It's truly a mix. Um, it's um, probably close to 50 50, honestly, between surgical and non surgical patients. Um, you know, there, uh, I, I think it's people who were already look, you know, who already knew they wanted a procedure, who, you know, who already knew they wanted liposuction or a rhinoplasty or a facelift, um, and were just looking for a surgeon that they connected with, um, mm -hmm. and saw my content and, you know, seemed to like me or like the way I explained things or explain why what I do is, you know, good or different. Um, and, um, and then I think some of it is, you know, people who are, you know, the other half are probably people who are kind of familiar, who are, you know, already into Botox and fillers or, you know, um, just, uh, you know, not, not jumping, jumping in with both feet with surgery and, and want to try Botox and fillers, um, or microneedling or whatever the non-surgical thing is, um, and then kind of develop comfort with you and say, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I was actually kind of thinking about a breast dog. I just wanted to make sure that I liked you first. Um, and so, you know, I came to you for Botox or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or maybe they just trust you more. I mean, the, mm -hmm. it seems to me like the 50% of non-surgical coming you're happy with, I mean, it's like an annuity to you just given your, your stage in practice, you know, mm -hmm. these patients are going to be the ones that get to grow with you and your practice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what happens also. I mean, I hope, you know, I hope that the people who, who I'm doing, you know, rhinoplasties and breast dogs on now are going to still like me in, you know, 30 years and come back and get their facelift from me when, you know, when we're both in our sixties. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I also think that's representative of how, uh, aesthetic surgery is practiced nowadays in that it exists on a continuum um, and, you know, along with non-surgical treatments. Sure. So, you know, people come in, they get Botox and fillers, they're not quite ready for a facelift, maybe they get some Morpheus or some face tight. Um, and then ultimately, you know, eventually they become ready for a facelift. And then those facelift patients want to maintain their result. And so they come back and get some more fillers, get microneedling, get lasers. Um, so it's kind of, um, I think that's kind of how modern aesthetic surgery is and should be practiced is, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, leave it alone for 30 years and then do a giant operation. Um, right. It's not all correction. Anymore. I think yeah. you're dead on. And I, I do, um, think that that's a, uh, differentiator between new school plastic surgery and maybe some old school plastic surgery, which is, mm -hmm. you know, new school plastic surgery includes prevention and maintenance and mm -hmm. correction versus yeah. correction only. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It, it reminds me of that, uh, woodcutter that the, the guy says, go, Hey, see all that, those trees over there, go chop them all down. And the guy goes and he chops them all down. He says, boss, I chopped all the trees down. He says, great, you're fired. And the idea is you got to plant trees, right? I mean, hmm. <laughs> not right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I think that's also, I mean, I think patients are coming to understand that. I think, you know, surgeons who, who are in the know are coming to understand that. I mean, the, you know, older, older surgeons who didn't train that way are evolving or, yeah. you know, or just, kind of, you know, fading, <laughs> fading away. Yeah. And younger surgeons are, hopefully learning that way um, and, and making that, you know, how their practice functions. Do you, so if a patient comes to you for non-invasive, I'm guessing you talk about the future down the road, you may want to this or that. Mm -hmm. if, if they come to you from, for surgery, are you also talking non-invasive? Like, how are you introducing one to the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually, it's funny. I just, I literally this morning finished writing an article about this. Um, but um, it's part of the conversation. You know, when someone comes in with a concern, um, I mentioned everything along the treatment spectrum, you know, that's that's a good option for them. So if someone comes in and they, you know, heard about face type, um, I talk to them about that, but I also talk to them about face lifts. And I also talk to them about you know, smaller options, um, like creatively using filler and neuromodulator to, to get the result that they want. Um, and, and then, you know, when we kind of pick on what the right option is for them at that point in time, in terms of how much recovery and, you know, what, you know, what, what, how much of a project they want to take on. Um, I also do talk about where everything else fits in. 
Um, and so, you know, doing, you know, doing, you know, Botox and filler and surface treatments afterwards to prolong the results of a facelift, um, you know, all the way down to making sure that you keep using sunscreen to keep your scars looking good and to keep your skin looking good. Um, are, are those menu options or are they part of the same, like, you know, are they, you can go one, two, three, or four, or, you know, this is going to be $8,000 and it includes this. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it like menu options. I think of it, you know, as, as, you know, parts of a treatment plan. Um, you know, uh, you know, if I'm talking to someone, um, I, I guess I keep coming back to FaceTime for some reason, <laughs> but if I'm talking to someone about that, I'll, you know, and they're, you know, they, they could be a facelift candidate. I'll say, you know, you know, the most maximal thing you can do um, to address your concern, the best shape that I can, you know, get for you, the best I can tighten your skin, the best I can, you know, rejuvenate your lower face is with a facelift um, and fat grafting for these reasons. Um, you know, that entails this much downtime, this scar, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you're not ready for that, you know, another reasonable option would be doing this for now. Um, doing some face tight and some eyelids and some fat crafting. And so this, this will address these concerns, um, but you might find over time that you still, you know, that you develop these concerns later on, or that, you know, this might push back the facelift that, you know, ultimately you'll, you'll want, but, but not prevent completely. Um, and so I think of it all, um, I try to think of everything, you know, holistically um, and think of, think of the whole patient and think about, you know, what their concerns are right now, what their concerns might be in the future, um, and, you know, how, how we can develop a plan that will, you know, take care of, take care of them appropriately. It goes along with that boutique practice, because you, you really are able to uh, be uh, focused 100% on the patient's concerns, and really, what the the patient's interested in and i'm guessing that you're involved in there there aren't patients that are coming in your office that don't meet you mm -hmm. yep correct correct it's it's me it's me and my office manager we're about to bring on some more people um soon um but but yeah yeah i you know i'm i'm involved in every treatment decision everything um that happens um and and yeah that's you know, that's very much, you know, I want people to, you know, to feel that way. I'm always a little surprised when people, um, you know, send an email in, you know, to our office email asking for a consultation and, and say, oh, am I going to see the doctor? Because there are some places where, you know, you go in for a consultation, you can't see that I'm doing air quotes if you're just listening, um, but they're getting a, you know, a consultation from a salesperson or, you know, a nurse or an office manager, a patient care coordinator. And those people might be experienced and they might, you know, have, have a good idea of what's going on and be able to answer people's questions. But, you know, it's really not, um, you know, in my opinion, at least it's really not a consultation. It's really not a plan until the surgeon sees you and talks to you and examines you. And, you know, you come up with a plan together with the surgeon. To me, that's the consultation. So yeah, there's no, you know, there's no, you know, talk to a salesperson and that's your quote unquote consultation or, you know, talk to whatever clinic staff and that's your quote unquote consultation. Um, everything comes comes to me. Um, and I do I extend that all the way through the course of treating a patient also. Um, I know it's probably a little uh, a little controversial, a little atypical, but if I did surgery on you, you have my cell phone number. Um, so if you have any quite and I encourage people to use it, if you have any questions, if you have any issues, you know, I don't want any of my patients to ever have an unanswered question or a problem that I don't address. Um, and so they, I encourage people to reach out to me personally and people honestly use it and don't really abuse it, um, yeah, yeah. which is, which is great. And which is what I want. It's so much, it's better for their care. Um, and it's better for just the office running smoothly rather than, you know, someone calls in, talks to, you know, the office manager, or whoever picks up the phone, asks them a question. They say, oh, I think this, but let me check with the doctor. And then they wait until I'm out of surgery to ask me that question. And then it's five hours later. And they ask me that question, and then I relay it back to the patient and call the patient back. That's so much inefficiency compared to patient, you know, calls or, you know, reaches out to me directly. Um, you know, sometimes we FaceTime real quick just to, you know, make sure that we're on the same page, um, talk about something, 
I put a quick note in the chart. It's it's done. Their questions answered. Everyone you know moves moves on, and the patient is cared for. And I'm sure that process had some to do with your decision making in terms of not taking on the reconstructed cases. I mean, it really gives you the opportunity to spend the time with the select patients that are coming, you know, for, for cosmetic uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, and that's, and I, I, I honestly, I really enjoyed reconstructive surgery. Also, I love doing it during residency. I, you know, there are certainly things that I miss about it. Um, but, you know, it was a question of what type of practice I wanted to create. And I really wanted to create this, you know, you know, very, very specialized, super high quality focused cosmetic practice um, and uh, and kind of made the decisions to let me do that. You, we touched on this, but I just, I want to end with uh, maybe where we started, which is this, I, I don't want to call you a little fish because I don't think mm -hmm. you're a little fish, but a, you know, a, a, a new fish and a, a newer fish in a, in a huge pond. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. agree on the huge pond of New York. Um, and I guess I want to ask you what your strategy is in terms of, uh, and, and we've heard a lot of it in terms, like we just finished with this whole concierge style VIP practice, but what, other things do you think make a patient want to pick you or what are you striving mm -hmm. for them to to see in you that makes them want to pick you mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's really um uh you know it's that it's the personal connection it's it's liking each other i only want to operate on people that i like and i i hope all my patients like me um it, it's also being able to present uh, something that's different um, and, um, and you know, in my opinion, better than the way things are, you know, ha have been practiced or were practiced in the past. Um, I like to, you know, I think there are um, some, some great advances that have, you know, become more a part of, you know, certain procedures. Um, I think this uh, style of being able to provide a whole continuum of aesthetic care um, is, uh, is kind of a newer thing. And I, I like to be able to present those things and explain why, you know, I, what I think I do in a rhinoplasty is better and different than what you might find from someone else that you might go to. Um, and I think that's been the biggest challenge to communicate, but I also think it's the most fruitful thing to communicate, um, and, um, and encourage people to, you know, want to come and see me for a particular reason. Um, you know, uh, I, I think people, uh, novelty is a double-edged sword. I think, you know, novelty makes people nervous, um, but it also excites people and interests people. Um, and so I think the challenge is being able to present why what you do is new and better and different um, than someone that they could have gone to, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, doing the exact same thing, which works, which is great. I mean, you sure. know, people people who have been doing the same, you know, rhinoplasty for 20 years do it because, you know, they've been pretty happy with it. Um, but trying to explain why I do things differently than they do and why, you know, uh, you know, if you're looking for a certain thing or expecting a certain thing from, from your procedure, why, you know, I think what I do delivers that to them. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's a challenging thing to communicate, but I think it's also a, a successful thing. And I think that also is what gets patients to, you know, sign up and be excited for, for you, not just excited to have a rhinoplasty or a facelift, but excited to have, you know, Jeff Lysecki do their rhinoplasty or their facelift. It makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a, a testament to your open sharing of information and really extending yourself and opening up personally to patients that gives them that sense of, of, of liking you. So I can see uh, why your practice is growing and will continue to grow uh, mm -hmm. steadily and for a long time. I sure appreciate you spending the time today. I, for those in our audience that want to follow you on social media or watch what you're doing or get in touch with you for mm -hmm. whatever reason, can you share some of your contact info? Yeah, absolutely. And, th and thank you so much for having me and interviewing me. This is really, really fun to get to talk about. Um, 
my my contact information, uh, you know, first off, my handle is Dr. Jeff Lysecki, so D R J E F F L I S I E C K I, um, and it's the same handle on Instagram and TikTok. So please follow me, interact, ask questions. I love talking to people on those platforms. Um, my website is the same, drjefflysecki.com. Um, you can also uh, call in at two one two six eight zero four six two six, and that's my office line. You'll get a hold of Sonia and um, you know set up set up whatever consultation you'd like. Terrific. Well, if you didn't get all that information, if you go to the page on the businessofesthetics.org under this podcast, we will list all that information so you can pick it back up and get with Dr. Lysecki. Dr. Lysecki, I'd ask you uh, as well. We have a really active Facebook group. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. on Facebook and also a LinkedIn, but we have. I think close to 4,500 on Facebook now and a few oh, wow. thousand on LinkedIn under the group business of aesthetic, not the page, but the group, um, okay. which is a private group. But I would love for you to start interacting there. A lot of physicians are interacting with each other. And um, and I think you'll find it useful too, because a lot of times it's someone who say, you know, what's a pay schedule for an ad advanced injector or how, I don't want to pay commission. I want to switch to this or mm -hmm. you know, really a lot of the, the business questions. And then lastly, for our audience, I want to thank our uh, uh, sponsors, MRP, Laser Optic, iLeaseWorks, uh, Pronox, uh, CareStream America, and uh, remind you tomorrow, oh, sorry, on Thursday, um, uh, oh, actually, sorry, I think this will air afterwards. So um, I was going to say we're doing an event on do you need to keep maintenance agreements going on all your equipment it's costing you thousands of dollars a year to keep things under warranty and if you have a three four five year old piece of equipment or 10 of them should you be keeping them all under warranty how do you do preventative maintenance we have a terrific panel discussion so if you're hearing this after go to businessofesthetics.org and you can download that one but dr Lysecki, thank you again so much for joining us really uh, a pleasure to speak with you and thank you for sharing your information with the business of aesthetics community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's really been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us this week on the business of aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors, MRP, Laser Optech and Equa Marketing and silver sponsors, Eilis Works and Pronox. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetics business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head on over to www.businessofaesthetics.org slash podcast dash show and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.